Well, tonight we wrap up our series on Christmas carols just in time for our Christmas Eve service. Brian started out this series uh, with Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. Last week, Larry covered A Little Town of Bethlehem, and I'll be wrapping up O Holy Night tonight. Let's pray. Dear Father, Lord, as we just come before you right now. Father, I pray that you would just speak through me. Lord, I pray that I would be able to communicate uh, just what you've been putting on my heart as we've been just working on this message together. Lord, I thank you for this series. I thank you for these carols, Lord. And um, even though a lot of them are like Christmas songs, Lord, they speak so much truth about you. They have so, so much theological depth to them. And so I just thank you for them. And I thank you for this series. In your name, amen. All right, cool. Well, oh, holy night. So legend has it that on Christmas Eve of 1870, about six months into the Franco-Prussian War, that a French soldier raised his head up out of his trench and began to do something that was completely out of the ordinary, completely out of character for somebody at war to do. He began to sing And in the middle of this cold, dark, war-torn night, his melody, they said, floated across the air, crossed the trenches, and to the other side. The song that he was singing was Cantique de Noel, or O Holy Night, as we know it today. And instead of firing upon him, which is probably what I would have done, it said that a German soldier then lifted his own head out of the trenches and began to sing back to him a hymn from Martin Luther, called from heaven above to earth I come. Each side then started to take turns firing back and forth carols at each other all night long instead of bullets. And tradition says that this time of peace went on for 24 hours as soldiers from both sides agreed to a temporary truce in honor of Christmas Day. O Holy Night continues to this day to be one of the most popular Christmas carols of all time being covered by many musicians, uh, musicians like Elvis Presley, Patti LaBelle, Ella Fitzgerald, and more recently, Mariah Carey, Kelly Clarkston, Carrie Underwood, and Calvary's own Tori Kelly. So she has one of the best renditions of it too. You might want to check that out. I'm a little biased, but I love that kid. But it's hands down one of the greatest Christmas carols ever written. But the crazy thing is that Oh Holy Night didn't start off as a Christmas carol at all. Matter of fact, it didn't even start off as a song. Originally, it was written as a poem. In 1843, a small church in France had recently restored its church organ, and a priest had asked the poet, Placide Capot, if he could write something down for the special event. And since he was a native of that town, Capot agreed. But the poem that he originally wrote sounded way more like a fiery sermon than it did a Christmas carol, preached about the fall of mankind through the stain of original sin and in turn man's desperate need for a savior. Nevertheless, the poem was still well received and composed original version of O Holy Night read like this. It said, midnight Christians, it's the solemn hour when the God man descended to us to erase the stain of original sin and to end the wrath of his father. The entire world thrills with hope on this night that gives it a savior. People kneel down, wait for your deliverance. Christmas, Christmas, here is the redeemer. The redeemer has overcome every obstacle. The earth is free and heaven is open. He sees a brother where only there was a slave. Love unites those that irons had changed. Who will tell? him of our gratitude, for it is for us that he is born and suffers and dies. People stand up, sing of your deliverance. Christmas, Christmas, sing of the Redeemer. It's a very beautiful and theologically rich poem, but it's somewhat different from the the lighthearted version of the song that we all sing today. And that's because it was softened a little bit as it was translated into English by the minister John Sullivan Dwight. And nevertheless, the English version still retains much of its original meaning and depth, especially the section that I've chosen for us tonight, which reads, Long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. He goes on to say, A thrill of hope 
the re- weary world rejoices. And I think that that still captures the heart of Capo's original poem. This idea of a world that's fallen into sin, but this thrill of hope at the birth of a Savior who's coming to redeem them. So I wanted to focus most of our attention on those two parts of the carol tonight. The first being, long lay the world in sin and error pining, and the second, till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. And then at the end, we're going to touch on the weary world rejoicing. So long lay the world in sin and error pining. Pining is one of those archaic words, right, that often gets overlooked in our English version of the song. And if I'm being honest, I've sang through this song my whole entire life without ever considering what pining means, right? But that word pining has a couple of meanings. It can mean to miss something and to long for the return of it. If you think of a loved one that's gone away for a long time, you pine for them, you pine for their return, But it can also mean to waste away because of sadness or grief. You're just pining away in sorrow. You're you're wasting away because of sadness and grief. And as I was thinking about it, I think that those are both really good descriptions of a world that's lost in sin. A world that's wasting away in sadness and longing for something it's missing. Right? The world is constantly filling its heart with every kind of idol imaginable, but it's never satisfied with what it has. And if we're being honest with ourselves, I think that sometimes we wrestle with that too. Filling our heart with every idol imaginable and never being satisfied. That's the state of the world without Christ. The world is pining away, spiritually wallowing in sadness and grief. In Romans 8, 22, Paul says, for we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up into this present time. Basically meaning that all of creation is in pain and misery, desperately seeking to be delivered from sin, waiting to be freed from its bondage, waiting to be freed from its decay and corruption. The world knows that it's broken, but it doesn't know how to fix it. It's blinded that way, right? It knows it. it's missing something. The world knows that it's not right, but it's completely blind as to what to do about it, as, to, as about what it is, right? I think that that's what John Sullivan Dwight was trying to communicate in his English version, that there's something inside of all of us that's constantly yearning for restoration, something that pines for what's lost, It's almost as if the world had this faint memory of the Garden of Eden, right? But that memory is too far gone and they can't remember how to get back there. And so the world continues in sin and error, pining for this utopia that it knows it had at some point. It's interesting because if you ask the the average person, right, Christian or non-Christian, what their idea of utopia looks like. They, they mostly respond the same, but often they say it's a peaceful place, right? A place where that has no wars, no fighting, a place where everybody lives in harmony. They'll say it's a safe environment, a place where all of its citizens can live in safety without fear of anything. Oftentimes they'll say it's a just place, a place that treats all of its citizens with dignity and equality. Everyone's basically describing perfection, when they speak of utopia, right? But they're really describing the Garden of Eden, right? And we as Christians know that that's exactly what the consequence of original sin has done. It's taken away our utopia. We see the consequences of our parents' decision in Genesis 3. After Adam and Eve had eaten the fruit to the woman, God said, I will make your pains in childbirth very severe with painful labor, You will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. To Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you. And you will eat the plants of the fields by the sweat of your brow and you will eat your food until you return to the ground since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. Our parents all 
gave up paradise for the pleasures of one sin. And because of that, they broke everything. They literally broke the whole entire world. I don't know if you've ever broken anything before, especially something that's important. When I was younger, I would play catch out in the front of my house. And we had this huge bay window out in the front of my house. And my dad would always tell me to play ball outside, get away from the window, right? Because one of those days you're going to accidentally throw, you already know where I'm going. You're going to throw something right through it, right? And I remember one time we were playing super close to the window and I could hear my dad's voice in my head, right? Stay away from the window. And I was like, he's not here. We're going to keep playing. And the next throw went straight through the window. And I literally wanted to run away from the house. I literally thought about just never coming back, right? But that's exactly what happened. Because of their rebellious choice, the earth is broken. Our relationship with one another is broken. We don't treat each other the way that we should. We use each other. We abuse our relationships. Our physical bodies are broken because of their decision. We were meant to live forever in our physical bodies. And now he says, to dust, you will return. God's saying, you're going to have to die now because of those choices. Because of your rebellion, you're going to have to put up with death and disease. And even worse, if you think about it, our souls are broken. We're now spiritually dead and blinded to the things of God. We have to be made new. All of creation cries out in misery the whole world in sin and error pining. It says, until he appeared and the soul felt its worth. John Sullivan Dwight writes that at the appearance of Christ, the soul felt its worth, meaning that the, the soul felt value at that point. The incarnation of Christ moves us from hopelessness to hope because his appearance reassures us that we're valued by him. And our souls desperately want to feel valued if we're being honest with ourselves, right? You want to feel valued. That need to feel valued is so deeply embedded in each and every one of us. And we prove that every single day by constantly seeking the approval of other things to validate that feeling, right? Whether it's from our parents or our friends, or our employers, or the opposite sex, we constantly seek the approval of others. And maybe that's why it hurts so much when we get overlooked, when we don't get appreciated, when we're put down, because it feels like it takes away from our value as a person. And so we look to other things to prove that value, like beauty, or vocation, or accomplishments. Accomplishments are a huge way that we try to prove our worth. When I was in junior high, I ran track for Whittier Christian. I know you can't tell from my current physique, but I was semi-athletic back then. But I worked really hard to become the fastest sprinter on our team. And I would do that by training every single day with the fastest kids. You run against the fastest kids because you wanted to become faster. And the faster I became, the more valuable I felt. By the time I hit eighth grade, I was the fastest person on our team. I ran the 100, the 200, and the four by 100. My team praised me. My coach loved me. My parents were proud of me. It's like one of those times in life, right, where everything just falls into place when you're shining, all eyes are on you, and you feel like you're on top of the world. And we had this giant scoreboard and it was in the locker room. So as you came into the locker room, it was this giant scoreboard. And written on it were the names of the three fastest athletes in every single track event of all time. History of the school. Just plastered up there, right? But the only way to get onto that board was to beat one of those high school or high score records in an official school track meet. You had to go to a track meet. You had to place at the track meet. And that was the only way to get on there. And so that became the focus of my next accomplishment. It wasn't just about being the fastest. Now I wanted to break one of those records and I was determined to get on that board. And so I trained every single day. I went to every single meet. And finally, after two years of training, I made it to the board for the 100 yard dash. Now, I only made it to third place, but I was on the board. 
right? And so much of my value was placed on that accomplishment. Every time I came into the locker room, my name was up there for everyone to see. And I held that title until the end of our season. At the end of our season, I, I hurt my back and I had to pull out of our last track meet, last one ever. And during that last track meet, my record was beaten by this dude named Luke Clardy. You know how I remember that name? Because I had to stare at that name every time I came in to the boys' locker room. So fast forward about four years, right, into the future after I graduated from high school. And I went to work for Whittier Christian doing maintenance. And I remember walking in to that locker room. This is five years later. And his name was still up there on the board. Every time I cleaned that locker room, I'd just stare up at his name, right? I'd have to look at it every single time. And he only, guys, he only beat me by milliseconds. And he held that record for five years. But here's what's crazy. A year later, we closed down the junior high campus. And we moved the, the junior high to the elementary campus in Whittier. And that scoreboard was moved. And in the move, it was just tossed into a storage bin. And over time, the names started falling off. And the scores all started falling off. And guess what? At that new campus, no one cared. No one cared about it at all. It had absolutely no value to anybody there at all. I mean, it was like my idol everything that I put my value in and nobody cared about it. Nobody cared about any of the accomplishments on that board. It didn't mean anything to anybody at that new school. All of those years of achievements thrown into a storage bin and forgotten. Your accomplishments are not what give you value. And if they are, if your accomplishments are what you're basing your value on, it's only a matter of time before people forget what you've done. If your value is wrapped up in beauty, the Bible says that beauty is fleeting. The Hebrew word for fleeting means a vapor or a breath. If you are wrapped up in beauty, it is a vapor or a breath. Your beauty will fade as quickly as a breath leaves the mouth is what that is trying to communicate. If you placed your value on your vocation or your career because you have the kind of job that pays well, or you have the kind of job that earns you respect and you have value in that. You're over people. They respect you. Let me just say this. Honestly, whatever job you have, one day it'll be given to someone else. One day you'll be moved along. Eventually you'll be replaced. Listen, your value is not because of your achievements or your vocation or how beautiful you are. You're valuable because God considers you valuable. Because he gives worth to your soul. Because he has put a price on your head. He places the price of your value. And he considers you extremely valuable. Yes, I know about the depravity of man. And I know that our righteousness is as filthy rags. And I know that in our flesh no good dwells. I know these things. But I'm not saying we're good. What I'm saying is we're valuable. Jesus says that you're valuable. In Matthew 6, 25, he says, Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? You're valuable to God. Number two, the incarnation is proof of your value. If you want proof that God loves you, if you want proof that you are valuable, the God who created the world turned himself into a created being for you. The God who created the world turned himself into a human for you. Philippians 2, 6 through 7 says, though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. One of the greatest ways to show your love for someone is to step into their life 
Step into their pain. Get to know them personally, right? That's one of the greatest ways you could ever love somebody is stepping into where they are, meeting them where they're at. And at the incarnation, God humbles himself and he becomes a man so that we're able to look at him now face to face. We're able to get to know God personally through Jesus Christ. Christ was sent as a human to bridge that gap between the spiritual and the physical. Christ was sent to step into our lives, to live with us, to suffer with us, and to experience what we experience. And not only experience what we experience, but to overcome it for us. And what's crazy to me as I was thinking about it, right? It's, it's not that just Christ put on like this, this human suit and he could take it off. It's not that he's a God who wears a human body, right? God the Son, and I know we know this, but it's weird to think about, right? God the Son is forever a human now. He's still God, but there's no going back to what he was before, right? There's no undoing what he's done. That's a huge commitment. He's not going back. When you see Jesus in heaven, it's going to be face to face, right? As a human looking with your human eyes into his human eyes. When you touch him or hug him, it's going to be body to body. That's how much he valued you. That's how much he was committed to you. Is he absolutely changed almost what he was? His flesh is proof of your worth. And even more than that, the biggest proof of your value will be when you see for yourself what's carved into his flesh, right? When you see for yourself the holes in his hands and the scars in his feet, it's one thing to step into your creation's pain. It's one thing to get to know them, right? But it's a whole nother thing to die so that you can bring them out of that pain. Jesus said, greater love has no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. And it's because of that that the weary world rejoices, it says. Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. The weary world rejoices because it can find rest for its soul now in Jesus Christ. Like I said, Earlier, the world has been groaning with labor pains for a very, very long time, right? But pregnancies don't last forever. Eventually, when the child is delivered, the mother finally finds rest. Jesus promises you and your soul that kind of rest. And so I would ask you tonight, right? Do you feel overwhelmed? Are you burdened with sin and error? Have you come to a place where you want release from the burdens and rest from your soul? Then I would say, lay them down at the feet of Jesus. Confess your sins and come and find your value in him. Amen? Amen. All right. I know that's kind of early. Hopefully Romulo can hear me. I'm going to pray. Maybe he can make his way out here. Father, Lord, we just come before you again tonight. God, we thank you so much for sending your son to us, Lord. We thank you so much for getting to know us on a personal basis, for stepping into our pain, Lord, for stepping into our misery. God, for not just leaving there and, and seeing what it is, Lord, but pulling us out of it, Father, redeeming us to yourself through your son. God, I pray that as we sing this song again, Lord, that we would have those thoughts in our mind, Lord, of, of what you accomplished through your son. God, I pray that during this season, Father, that we would uh, just have that thought in our mind again of what you've done. Lord, I, I pray that we would be able to share that also with others. We love you. In your name, amen.